Hello everybody and uh, welcome to the stream. If we can do a quick sound check and uh, if you can hear me on Facebook and um, on Twitch and on YouTube, uh, please uh, let me know in the uh, chat and we can get going. Right, looks like we got a nice amount of people following. And uh, okay, so great, a couple of people on Twitch. Thank you, striking and bear wolfish. And I guess uh, okay, good. YouTube is a go too. And I think Facebook is the one with the delay, so we'll wait a few seconds for Facebook as well. But I'm sure it's going to be fine. So um, for all those of you that are uh, catching up, if you haven't been following the programs, uh, you can go to ZBrush Live. And I'm going to bring that up. So on ZBrush Live, you can uh, go ahead and find me. Right now, this is uh, going on. But um, you can just go to Presenters. And uh, in the Presenters, you can look for me. I'm here somewhere. There we go. And um, you can follow my streams from before. So notice that we did about nine before where we made this robot. And in this season or this series, uh, of which this is episode number three, we're doing a spinner. So um, you can kind of um, go in here and subscribe. And again, this is going to be streaming on all three channels. And I believe the video will be available afterwards as well on uh, on Twitch and on YouTube and I think also on Facebook. So you can watch it after the fact as well. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, continue and uh, move forward. So last time we kind of did a bit of a rough uh, sketching on uh, on this and we also did some painting on top of our model and started to establish the primary forms and some secondary forms and today we'll start kind of tightening it up a little bit uh, further so uh, also we do have some drivers in here so under the um, this is where the drivers would sit and we also have kind of a a placeholder for where we're going to construct the internals of the of, of the car and um, we'd done a bunch of different concepts and this is the one we kind of settled on so uh, today I'm going to kind of continue working on it so before I do that um, one of the things that we uh, are going to put on top here is going to be a um, a, one of those drones that flies off. So in the in 2049, the car had a drone that was kind of housed in this area, and it took off. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just going to go ahead and append a Polymesh 3D, and initialize it as a Q cube down here, and then go into the Z Modeler. Uh, did it add it? It did. And where is it? Down here somewhere. Yep. So we're just going to go move it up here and kind of make a rough, uh, rough a uh, drone with with this cube. So I'm just going to move it into about where it goes back here and uh, make it a bit larger, flatter. And it's going to. I'm just kind of right now establishing the overall kind of the. Um, bounding box or the over overall volume and it is going to be inclined but right now I'm just going to basically uh, work on it this way and I am going to turn on polyframe so I can see kind of what's going on and uh, switch to the Zmodeler brush and start Q meshing this thing down let's turn on symmetry too and uh, what we're going to do here is get rid of this bottom part like so and start uh, figuring out maybe it's going to be this shape and I'm very quickly going to develop some sort of a silhouette for this and then we'll develop it further. I think it's getting this is a bit too wide so let's make it a bit narrower like so. So yeah it's just going to be housed in this area and just going to fly off so we're going to try and do uh, I want to turn it and match it but I don't want to I shouldn't do that yet before I uh, put in some more more details. Alright looks like I inadvertently added no, I'm okay. 
All right, so here again, I'm just going to want to work very, very loose just to kind of get some overall shapes. I'm using a Q mesh here, which is really neat for making this kind of stuff. Um, and maybe it's got a little bit of a tail. And I don't want it to really look like the one in the movie. Um, here, I'm going to clip some of this. I don't want it to look too much like the one in the movie. Maybe come up with something a little bit more original. Uh, we're assuming that maybe this car is in the same universe, but maybe um, a few years further along uh, for the, maybe the next movie or something like that. All right, and then let's slide these edges forward. And by the way, if you have questions, I will uh, more, be more than happy to answer them for you. Uh, they could be general ZBrush questions as well. If it doesn't distract us too much, uh, I can answer them. I don't know if I'm lighting, liking this front part, so maybe I'll start. And I'm going to kind of get the car out of the way for now. And um, see if I can uh, think kind of, here we go. What I like about ZBrush is that uh, the hard surface tools, you can very easily switch into the sculpting tools again and do some cool kind of um, sculpting as well as using things like ZModeler. All right, so no questions yet. That's a good thing. Hope everybody's having a good Friday. just got home from work so um, kind of worried I was going to be a little late but luckily I was home just in time all right so here we've got kind of a general shape I'm going to bring back the car just to see how big this is it's a bit too big it's a bit too fat so here again we're just making those minor adjustments uh, and I want this thing to be uh, pretty cool on its own and give it some cool functions, maybe have it be, um, I mean, besides it being a monitoring thing, maybe it has some sort of a, a weapon on it as well, which, why wouldn't it, right? It's a police car. Um, all right, and I'm really liking the shape of this, so I'm gonna be kind of okay with this as a starting point, and now I can kind of position it over here, and I want it not to really mess up the silhouette of the car too much. Let's take off transparency, and let's say it goes in about this much into the car, and uh, that's fine. And I want it to kind of mesh with the, uh, or meld with the kind of the a line of the car so there that kind of continues it over and um, that's good and then let's go ahead and give it maybe some sort of wings although wings don't seem to be a thing in this universe things seem to just kind of float but um, again a semblance of something maybe some sort of a air lawn or something that can make it um, you know, have some sort of a compelling view to it. So maybe this kind of a thing. That's a bit too fat. Yeah, something like that. Good. All right, so there it is. And open it up this way as well. And I want this to be kind of thinner and let's see if I can do that with just sculpting tools. Seems like I can. So that's good. So it kind of has these types of uh, things over here. And let me try another two this way. See, now that I turned it, it's going to be a little bit more challenging, but it'll work still. Maybe something like this. There we go. So it's not really wings, but it's something to maybe stabilize it. And if there's wind or something like that, uh, it will kind of maybe um, hold it together. 
if I actually Q meshed it twice here or not. I did Q mesh it twice. Okay, so I'm going to try and get similar shape again. There we go. Maybe like that. And just smooth it out. So it has some sort of a kind of a, a shape. Maybe I can uh, double down on that and give it another one down here. Like so. Try and match this as much as I can. Doesn't have to be perfectly matched. And again, this is just an idea for it. So there it is, like so. So I think there were a lot of people that were doubting that ZBrush could be used for hard surface and hopefully by watching at least my stream you're kind of convinced otherwise. I think you can do some amazing stuff with ZBrush for hard surface. I'm using it at work for hard surface and uh, I think it's definitely a very neat hard surface tool. All right, I think that's good enough for now, and uh, we'll kind of do a little bit more work on this and make it look. It's looking very spaceshipy, and which is fine, but uh, I kind of want it to look more kind of cyberpunkish. So we'll kind of work on it a little bit more. All right, so those things that I added kind of augmented to the A line. So again, I just want to make sure I continue that kind of line of the car as much as I can. Um, and that looks like it's neat. It could just kind of take off on top of this and fly out. Maybe it's a little bit too long, maybe a little bit shorter like this. And there it is. All right, so uh, we'll just kind of, you know, I kind of like it longer because it kind of continues that A-line, but maybe what I can do is keep this part and bring this back part in a bit like so and I'm liking that a lot more all right cool all right so that's that for the drone so we'll go ahead and leave it there for now and then let's switch back to the car and start working on it so I don't need polyframe on um, I have quite a few people on here nobody has questions all right, so now I'm just basically, um, I did some painting here to establish some designs on here. So now what I'll do is go to Damien Standard Brush and start carving in some of these uh, designs of the um, poly paint. And again, my model is pretty uh, light here. It's about 126,000 polygons, so it's not too heavy. And um, and these lines are going to appear a bit jagged, but again, I'm just establishing different shapes, and then eventually, what we're going to do is cut out cut out all those pieces individually and work on work on them as uh, individual pieces. So right now, all I'm doing is again just establishing where some cut lines are going to be. So whatever we establish that whatever is this darker color is going to be glass. So we'll eventually cut these glass pieces off. And um, make them their own separate models and kind of fit them into what we have. So there's that. It's kind of hard to see with the uh, two pylons. So what I'm going to do here is um, use the selection tool so I can hide those parts so I can work more on what's going on here. So this is the glass and again I'll turn transparency off. They're going to look down through this so again I just want to put myself where they are to see if that's a good spot for it and it looks like it is. Okay so they're going to see down below them when they're uh, going downwards. I'm sure they'll have cameras as well, but uh, it's always a good idea to uh, have something in the front just in case if they're coming down, if something is on the ground, they can kind of maybe get away from it. Okay, and then let's start. I'm going to take the poly paint off for a second here. 
uh, just to see how that's looking and that's looking okay so there'll be kind of a little bit here that's going to be separate so this is going to be one piece of glass and then somehow it's going to be attached fused to the other piece of glass which is this one and then I also have to figure out what the door is going to be like and how it's going to open and um, part of me likes the idea of it like opening up like a canopy of an airplane I think that would be a cool effect the problem with that is um, do I do concept design for film or games? Uh, yes, I do both. And commercials as well. So. Whatever they need me for. All right, I'm kind of figuring out like how this is going to open up. So if there's a hinge over here, it could open up this way. And again, I'm just kind of exploring the idea of it being a canopy type of a thing. So let's see what how this looks if the guy's looking to the side. I think he can still look through the side window, which is fine. Um, What sort of time would you spend on a concept? It all depends. Um, usually schedules are pretty rushed, so um, it depends. I mean, sometimes it's something really simple. And what's really nice in uh, ZBrush now is that I can take something like this and um, go into the BPR renderers and uh, just pick one here from the light box. Um, and you know do a quick render I guess I'll choose this one uh, maybe not that one but nice thing here is that I can just go to the BPR renders of uh, renders here and uh, or BPR um, filters and choose different ones like so and I can kind of give them an idea of what this looks like uh, pretty much in a rough form like usually it's a painting or a drawing for a concept design and a lot of studios and people still think that's the way to go uh, which you know uh, there's something to be said about doing something in, t in 2d that's fine um, this is really kind of scrolling too much one way or the other I don't know why but let's try this one uh, maybe this one I kind of like the one that's this um, this one right here, which is a blueprint. Maybe it doesn't. And there's a bunch of different blueprint ones, and uh, it kind of gives them a good idea of what the thing is going to look like from different angles. Um, if they want a 2D image, uh, a lot of times I usually spend time uh, doing this kind of stuff, actually in person, where I can kind of show them a turnaround like this and and get. Um, some comments right off the bat so for example if they don't like these back things and they say get rid of them I'll be like okay sure you know let's let's do that so you know I can just do that and say okay would this be better and they maybe they might agree or not so um, it all depends right it depends on the production it depends on the people it depends on whether I'm with the people or not sometimes I get on a Skype call and do live um, broadcasting and show them sometimes I just deposit a 2d a bunch of 2d images so it all depends on who it is but typically they're very fast schedules concept is one of those things where they want to um, iron it out pretty fast sometimes it takes forever too depends but you have to be fast you can't be taking too long So usually I would say, you know, if you can give them something in a day, that's great. Um, the next kind of time interval is about maybe a week, and then it's a month. So you can ask them what their schedule is like. Of course, they're going to say uh, a week is kind of what they'll want, but sometimes it could be more. 
and it depends on how many reviews you do too. Like sometimes you start, give it, you give them something in a day and then you spend a month kind of doing iterations. Again, I'm trying to figure out a door situation here. So we figured maybe this part pops up, like opens up uh, front to back uh, like this. And then the people need to get out so they can kind of get out in the front. Well, that's a good idea. But then they'd have to step over each other and the dashboard, so that won't work. So I still have to have some sort of a door on the side. And I have to figure out how that works. And again, I always want to see the people and if they were able to get out. And it looks like if the door was here, they would be able to get out just fine. So it's always good to kind of, you know, whenever you're doing whatever production uh, you're doing, you always have to have the people in there because that's who's going to be interacting with it. So maybe this will be kind of a, a cool triangular door handle. If that's even a thing in that time frame, because you probably can use your phone or whatever to open the door. Hello Nikki, does that answer your question? Hello Nikki. Cool. Sometimes they don't know what they want to, like you have to tell them what they want, which is kind of funny. All right, so I was toying around with the idea of maybe having something come around this way, like have the lights and whatnot, so we'll kind of look at it. I really enjoyed making this back part here. It kind of reminds me of older cars, but um, I think over time it's starting to um, it's starting to get uh, on my nerves, so I might change it, but I either will change it and put something else here or keep it and uh, actually let's try that. While I'm thinking about it, so let's append a, another poly mesh and change it into a box. Hello, what universe is this from? It's from the Blade Runner universe. We're trying to do kind of a spinner in that, you know, so flying car. We talked about it quite a bit on the first episode. Um, Deadless, G Deadless. So if you really want to know more about the concept and some of the um, reference we have, the first episode is a good one to watch. So I'm thinking something like this, maybe that uh, is um, over here. Man, I can't grab that scale thing. Here we go. All right. Like that. Turn polyframe on. Let's put a couple of edge loops here. Like so. And let's just move this back. Of course, it's not just going to be like this, but maybe something like this in the back and has the police lights and whatnot on it. So let's add some visual interest now that we kind of have a cage for it. And add some sort of a curve. So, so now it looks more like a spoiler and it kind of works better with um, what we have here. So maybe something like that, and then let's just move it up a bit, freeze these guys, and toy with lifting this up maybe. Not so high, but maybe to about there. Right, and then maybe we'll have some police lights and stuff on here later on. So I'm kind of liking that idea. Uh, more, so, but I'm still going to keep it as a separate part, and in the model itself, it'll be kind of attached. It won't be, it won't be part of the body. And uh, so that, like that, I'm just going to go up with a different variation here. So I'm going to duplicate it and hide this. And uh, I'm going to try to do a few things here of like maybe um, 
try a good angle to bring this in. See if I can get rid of it. See if this is a design that works better. Ooh, yeah, that looks cool. All right. And I want this kind of to have the same language as, um, or same design as the initial part here. So I'm going to continue this this way. And a beetle. Man, that's great if it is a beetle. It's one of the coolest designs of cars. All right, so let's say this is one option that we had, kind of sticking out this way, and then let's see if we can, you know, see if there's a variation of this that looks cooler. Maybe going downwards, no, up. How about if we make it not stick out, but point inwards? All right, uh, I think this is what we're going to go for right here. So that's good. And I'll have some stuff on the bottom right now. I have I don't really have anything, but maybe we can put some kit bash parts and whatnot. So, um, okay, so this top part is good. Let's start going back to the door. And you can see me jumping back and forth between different areas, and that's always a good idea. That way you don't like go back and forth on something over and over again. So here I'm trying to again figure out how that door would work. And I think this would be the top part of it like this. And it would come down this way. Like so. Let me remove the poly paint so I can kind of see it. And um, Right, and then I um, kind of don't like this flat look for the door, so I'm going to try and find a good design for it when I'm looking at it from the side. So maybe the door would come down this way, and I'm trying to get a interesting form here for it. What do I enjoy most about doing concepts for clients? Um, I don't know, I think kind of giving them something they really want. Like, you know, bringing an idea in their head uh, or in mind to life. And uh, it's always good to kind of do something new that uh, feeds into it. A lot of times you work on stuff that doesn't even see the light of day. So when something does see the light of day, I think that's something that's super enjoyable. And if you work with good um, people, it's always fun to uh, I mean, you know, in the end, it's a job, right? Just like anything else. All right. We're still kind of figuring out this door over here. And again, remember, all these parts are going to be separated out. So we'll probably start on that next week. Today, we'll be halfway through. Um, or, no, this is three, so we're not halfway through. We still have one more episode t until the half. All right, so now I'm kind of getting some good ideas of how this is going to work. So this part here is going to stay with the car. So I might start doing a different poly paint on this. So I'm just going to duplicate it. So I have a copy of the old poly paint. And then this one, I'm just going to go ahead and fill it with white, switch color, and start painting. Um, 
some new ideas on here. So this is just another version of that same car, but with different poly paint. So this time, actually, I should be consistent. Um, let's say I'm going to choose like a lighter blue, like so for the glass. So this is all going to be glass like this. The other thing I should also mention is the thing that I really enjoy is using ZBrush to do concepting. I just enjoy using ZBrush period. So um, if I get to uh, use it more uh, for work, it's great. Right now the job that I'm on, I'm using it quite a bit in ways that uh, the client did not even know ZBrush could be used. And uh, they are super, super happy with the speed of which I'm delivering assets to them. So it's always kind of good to be bringing new um, ideas to um, I think this part over here that's sticking out is the top of the chairs. All right so here is the glass part and this is going to be glass as well but it's just going to be a different glass part. So this part here stays put, and then this part here, using hinges, opens up to the front, like so. And the doors open as well. So this part here is glass also. Literally a glass door with some metal around it. Okay. I think there's enough canopy here. And again, we're assuming that uh, a lot of the displays and a lot of the navigation, everything is done by cameras. So this is just kind of a way for the people inside to see out. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and start painting the door. Again, ask questions. It's kind of, you know, it makes the... Um, stream more interactive. So here I'm trying to just kind of get an idea of what the door will look like by just using the paint capabilities. So. I haven't decided if I want this whole back thing here to be the door. I don't think so. So I'm going to erase it. But again, there's got to be enough of an opening for the guy to be able to step out. And again, let's turn on transparency. I think there is enough, but maybe a little bit further down. Like so. All right, so far so good. All right, I'm kind of trying to figure out what I'm going to do with this part. I think the door is pretty much okay for now. I'm gonna abandon it at this point. Maybe bring it down just a little bit more here. And give it that angle. All right, so that's our door. The door's open this way. The canopy pops forward. And the people get out. This is flush over here. And I'm um, just trying to see what I'm going to do with this part. Maybe there's a little bit of a door part over here as well. Oh, 
All right, I think I'm happy with that so far. So let's move on to something else. All right, so let's look at these front parts over here. I'm kind of liking the way they're angled this way. Uh, but another thing I wanted to do was to experiment with maybe angling the outside part too. So let's see what that would look like. Mm, no, I kind of like the way this is so far. All right. So we'll keep it as is, and then we will go ahead and start putting in some details. So this thing will house some tires. We talked about that a little bit. So there'll be two tires that are in here that can somehow come down when this thing is landing, and there will be maybe one tire over here or two tires. Um, both of the uh, designs for the Blade Runner movies had a tire in the middle over here. They didn't have two. But um, there's nothing to say that we can't have two tires on the back on our design. I figure these don't do much city driving. I think mostly they fly, but uh, the tires are mostly used for when they land, right? So, And if you have three, then that's enough for it to be able to be stable and land. So they're not going to drive big distances or anything like that. Kind of, I'm trying to experiment with this back part over here, see if I like it. And remember, I have a whole copy of the previous mod previous design that I had of this uh, saved already. So um, I can go back to my previous previous design if I decide, like if I take a direction I don't really like. Question. Well, it all depends. Uh, the uh, Oxenate or Oxanti, um, I think you're asking about how much functionality matters. Um, well, I mean, if, if it's going to be used, like if this thing is going to land in a movie and the people are going to get out of it, then you definitely want the doors to work, right? So if they're probably going to make a model of it and um, they're going to build it. So um, I have some uh, friends of mine that work in the industry and they do set design and they do prop design, not set design, but uh, they make the sets and they design the props uh, and, and build them. So a lot of those folks um, get really angry when concept designers give them things that just are not are impossible to build and impossible to really work. So. Um, it's all, I always think about that. I always think about the functionality of what I'm designing uh, because it's important that they do work somehow. But if this is something that's just going to be seen from far away and it's going to, you know, uh, not, whoa, that wasn't good. And if it's not going to be really, um, you know, if you're not going to really see the functionality of the door or anybody getting in and out of it, then why, why spend the time, right? So uh, it all depends. But I always try to think of things because um, if you build things in a way that they will work, then um, then they, they can be built and also the audience watching it will believe it. So, if you can, for example, if you watch the Transformers movies, I, mean, I really, my mind cannot get, my, get around to how these things transform or... Um, how somebody would be sitting inside of them as they transform. So, um, you know, the initial transformers, the toys themselves actually did transform. So I haven't really seen toys of the new transformers. And if there are some, it'd be, I'd be curious to know if they actually do transform and that they stay true to whatever uh, made them really the popular um, the popular things that they are. So, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting because the way they transform, they transform really fast and things go in and out and you really kind of see a lot of smoke and mirrors, but realistically, um, I don't know if, uh, if you can transform a car like that. So that said, I'm designing a car that flies, which we don't have. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's the other thing. It's like, how can you, um, 
how can you make people believe that this car will actually fly? And what about it is actually going to make them think it is going to fly? How long does it take me to uh, fully complete a model like this car? Well, um, it depends. I mean, you know, we're going to do this one in eight hours, right? Uh, not eight, 16 hours. So basically, we're going to do uh, eight stream sessions. <coughs> Excuse me. I need a drink of water here. So we're going to do um, 16 stream sessions, so 16 hours, two days. I have to get this thing done in two days. So I might spend an extra day outside of the streams to... Uh, do things that might be too boring for people to watch, um, like Retopo or all that. But um, but yeah, uh, I think you know I could probably get something you know showable within a day's work, and then a couple of days probably for something even more refined, and then a week would be kind of ideal. Um, So if the d people from making a new Blade Runner movie came to me and said, how long do you need to make something like this? I'd say, I'd give me a week and I'll have something for you. Um, is this another car? Uh, Plan Platano 82. What do you mean? Um, yeah, Net NetX. You can definitely ask some questions about ZBrush. And I'll be more than happy to answer them for you. And... Uh, Platano 82. Uh, do you mean another car from what's in the picture, like different than this one? It is a different one than that one. That one I made when I was um, beta testing ZBrush, uh, I think the last version, 2018. And um, so that was done then. This is, a, yeah, this is a completely new one. But it's the same one we started in this stream series. Uh, we just made a few changes to it, added this drone, added this top part here, which we're going to add lights and stuff to, and uh, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> NetX X, or Netrix, ask away. What questions do you have? Here I'm kind of still working on that silhouette. Kind of like this one being low, lower. So I'm going to actually get this design, but actually still sink it down like so. All right, working on a Venom modeling and have some problems with subtools. I see how people are creating many subtools and have to have no problem with merging them. Um, yeah. Um, Thanks, uh, Platano82. Um, yeah, so what do you, what, um, I'm kind of, um, the subtool question that you had. Yeah, it's, um, when you're creating a subtool, basically, um, you always have to think about it as being a separate part. So, like, if you're making Venom, I would make, uh, all the teeth a different subtool. I'd make the eyes maybe a different subtool, the tongue definitely a different subtool. And doing a little bit of planning before you make your model helps too. Like if you look at a painting or a drawing or a, a plastic kit of the ven of Venom, you can kind of start uh, figuring out what pieces you want to separate out. All right. It's starting to look more like a performance race car version of a spinner. And it's always good to kind of look at it small like this, just to kind of see if the silhouette will work, because in the movie it'll be kind of far away. So you see if you can recognize if, it, if, if it's far away, and you kind of can. And uh, so, so far, so good. One of the nice things about subtools that's like, you know, 
one of those things where you know you didn't have it before, but as soon as you have it, you wonder how you got to you know how you uh, were able to function without it is folders. Folders are so good. They just got added in 2019, and uh, they make life a lot easier for everybody. I use them all the time. All right. So here I'm just kind of carving away, refining the shape. Uh, oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. So the thing about merging subtools, that's a good point. So when you merge, you know, when you have a lot of models uh, that are really dense, uh, and and have a lot of polys. If you merge them, that's going to you know increase the number of polygons quite a bit. So you don't want to have one subtool that's like more than 15 million polygons um, or or so. You want to kind of you know make sure that you have a bunch of subtools and you're not putting every you know everything into one subtool because um, that way you're going to start getting really sluggish performance. So uh, definitely um, keep them as subtools for as long as you can. You don't have to merge them into one thing. And then if you have to, if you want to 3D print it or something like that, then you can decimate it and decimate your model. So you can put it into one subtool and decimate it. But after you're done, when you're not going to work on it anymore, does that help? Yeah, I mean, I've got models that have like, you know, 100, 200 subtools. I was working on a robot recently that had about 170 subtools. I wish I could show it, but I can't. Maybe one day. All right. I don't know what I'm doing with this part over here. Maybe not have it stick out so much. Subtools are really useful, and so are polygroups. So um, if you want to kind of have sections in your model, you can polygroup them. So here, for example, if I want to polygroup the glass parts, Right, so what I can do is I can go here. So bring up my um, wireframe or polyframe here. And what I could do is go here to um, polygroups. And where are the polygroups? Right, no, not polypaint, but polygroups right here. And I can say group from polypaint. And what that will do is if I to hide the paint now, is that it will create different groups for each one of those uh, the painted areas. So now notice that there's a different color, a different poly group for this, and I can isolate it. Um, let me get to this. I can isolate that part and just work on the glass parts, right? And then there is another part. The other part of it is a different poly group. So poly groups are really useful too in addition to subtools. So there's different ways of organizing in ZBrush. Um, um, yeah, you can you can email it to me uh, or um, Netrix, if you want me to take a look at your model. Um, if, you know, if I have time, I'll definitely give you some feedback on it. Go back to paint here, whoa. I noticed here that I had some uh, extra areas that I painted that I didn't really mean to paint. So there's that. And there's that, all right. So moving back to um, where we were. Venom is a cool thing to model. There's quite a few good Venom models on uh, ZBrush Central and ArtStation. 
It's a really interesting character. Cool looking. Very iconic. All right, so we have, this is kind of, I'm refining that front part a little bit more, trying to get some planes established. from what we had before. There are going to be some lights over here and I got to think about where some lights would be on this as well. And um, I'm kind of thinking that I'll have some sort of pop-up lights or some sort of light that kind of comes up and hides itself as well. Like big, you know, um, Um, oh, uh, so you're asking me where you can find my email, so I guess this would be a good time to kind of plug my uh, my location. So um, if you go to kermaco.com right here, this is my website, and if you click on contact, um, it gives uh, you a, a button here, email, and you can click on that, and hopefully this works. And then that will automatically generate an email, uh, whatever email client you have. Ouch, that did not uh, sound good, but yeah, that's how you do it. Okay, so just go to kermaco.com, K-E-R-M-A-C-O.com, and there's a big email button over here, so you can email it to me that way. And while you're there, you can take a look at my portfolio. So this was the spinner that we did earlier. Uh, so uh, this was one I worked on when I was doing beta testing ZBrush 2018. And as you can see here, I've got a, a few shots of it. And uh, this took me about, oh, that's not a, that's not the spinner. This took me about maybe, um, you know, from beginning to end, about a month, but I did a bunch of variations of it too. So there's different colorways, different uh, versions, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, while I'm here, I'll also talk about the ZBrush Summit that's coming up. So if you are in LA, the ZBrush Summit is a good thing to go to, and you can sign up. It's free, and they're amazing people. Like, there, it's three days of presentations by these folks. They just announced them, and uh, they're really, really uh, cool. They have the Sculpt Off, which I've participated in twice, which is also fun. And then uh, they also have some uh, classes. They have some workshops. So if you are in the LA area or close by or going to be here during that time, it's a it's a really great thing to um, come to live. And if you can't, uh, they will stream it live as well. So you'll get to see a lot of things uh, live, and the uh, sculpt off is really fun to watch. If, you know, if you get a chance, it's really fun to be part of, and it's really fun to watch as well. So, Netrix, yeah, that's great. You can um, send me an email, and also. Uh, I'll be more than happy to take a look at your model. And if you have questions, you can always ask in the email as well. So I'm trying to figure out what this thing over here is going to be. I kind of like this. Um, maybe let's see if I can follow a good angle here for this. So maybe these could be lights or they could be some sort of device, antennas, something that could stick out. Um, all right, so now I'm just gonna go to Damien Standard here and figure out some designs and cut lines on here. To render in ZBrush or another program, uh, taking about thing. So yeah, I both. Uh, so ZBrush is really good for doing two kinds of things, two kinds of renders. It's good for doing non-photorealistic rendering, like we did before. 
So here I can just press one button and kind of get a cartoonish looking version of my, or non-photo looking version of my uh, spinner. Or like if I want it to look like a drawing, for example, I can do this and maybe this one would be better. And now it kind of looks like a drawing or I can use this one to make it look like something out of a cartoon or this one to kind of create, I mean like here, I just press one button and I got, uh, let me close this down kind of a really cool design for my car at this point. So this would be a cool render just to include, and you can modify these too. You can change the colors, you can change like these dots, for example, you can make them smaller, bigger. Uh, there's a lot of cool tutorials on Z Classroom on how to do it, but sometimes I do uh, non-photorealistic renders. And um, I guess I can talk about that on my uh, so here, in my on my website on top here are all of the different links to my social media stuff. So if you go to my Instagram over here, you can see that um, um, I have some non-photorealistic rendered stuff. So here, this is kind of rendered in that non-photorealistic renderer. Um, this is done in, in ZBrush, so this is directly out of ZBrush, no external program at all. Just you press a button in ZBrush and you get this. This is done in ZBrush, so I rendered this in ZBrush. So sometimes I render non-photorealistic stuff like this in ZBrush directly, right? So um, I don't have to uh, get out of ZBrush. But and then sometimes I use KeyShot to get something that looks more like this. So um, you know, if I want something to look more um, like that, for example, then this is done in KeyShot. This is done in KeyShot as well. And lately I've been using Octane Render and RenderMan, so uh, I sometimes export my model and uh, do the rendering in one of those programs. So yeah, there's a lot of different options, but it's amazing what you can do with just what ZBrush gives you. Like I want this to be in an oil painting, I just press one button and now my car looks like it's in an oil painting, right? So <laughs> it's uh, it's really, you know, it's really great to, to kind of just showcase what you're working on um, early on and then um, as you uh, as you want it to be more photorealistic then you can take it out into different renderers and use those add materials and whatnot but the non photorealistic renders are pretty um, forgiving for creating um, for creating really kind of cool renders early on without having a lot of detail. If you go with a kind of a photo reel, like if I take this into KeyShot, it's not gonna look very good, right? Because we don't have a lot of the details that we need to make it pop. Um, um, oh, thank you. Yeah, the, the non-photorealistic renders were just added to uh, to ZBrush. Another thing you can also do in ZBrush, and a lot of artists do that, is you can render layers. So you can render multiple layers. So I can take this car, for example, and I can render it, um, you know, with different layers. So let's say this is kind of the look. This is the angle that I want. And I'll go ahead and turn a perspective on here. And so this is, let's say, this is the angle I want for the car. So what I can do is I can uh, start assigning materials to it. So I'm gonna take the poly paint off. And let's say I go with a different material. So let's say I go with like this shiny red material like this. And let's say I make this shiny red material really red and shiny, right? So I can do a render like this, right? So this is one render. And then I can do another render that's an outline like that. And then I can do another render that's a different material that has some reflectivity on it. And then I can do another render that's going to be this like gray horizon. So what a lot of people do is they do all of these renders separately as different uh, layers. And then they bring it into Photoshop and comp them together and then get something really compelling, right? So a lot of people do that and um, it's a, it, you know, they get some amazing results right from uh, ZBrush and Photoshop. And the good news is that these renders take very little time. So if I do this and uh, let me take the poly paint off and hit BPR to do a render, this render happens very, very quickly. Oh, <laughs> I guess I should just go back to the normal um, filter here. There we go. 
So this is what a BPR render would look like. It has shadows, you can see the shadows in here, and you can also turn on ambient occlusion. So let me do that too. So here in the render properties, you can turn on ambient occlusion and then just hit BPR. And notice this render takes very little time, right? So when you're done with this, you can just go ahead and go into document and export it as a, as a file. So you can just save it to your, um, save it as its own file. And what's nice is here, if you go to the render passes, you can see that there's a bunch of passes. So there's the beauty pass, there's a shaded pass, there's a depth pass you can use, there's a shadow pass, ambient occlusion pass, and a mask. So all these can be saved out for you. And uh, there is a plugin that ships with ZBrush called uh, ZBrush to Photoshop right here. And uh, there's a good, some good training on that and this will export all of them for you into uh, Photoshop and then you, in Photoshop you can kind of erase some to show another. So here for example this is red but if I want part of it to be red and part of it to be a different color I can just go and pick a different color here. Like let's say I want part of it to be gold so I render one of these in gold, right? And then in Photoshop if I erase certain areas and I have the red layer un, uh, underneath it, then it comes out um, it comes out looking, you know, uh, the, the, whatever's underneath will come out and then you can be working on different, multiple different um, materials on the same model on the same pose. Of course it's not like a renderer where you can move it around or whatever. You basically have to agree on what your pose is and what your composition is and then uh, work on it in Photoshop. So yeah. Yeah, um, there's a lot of really great tutorials and I think if you watch the stream, so if you go to um, if you go to, to the uh, ZBrush Live page and I, did I keep that up? Uh, I'll just go back to it here. If you go to ZBrush Live, there's a lot of different artists that uh, do amazing stuff and um, you know if you just look at their pictures over here you can kind of tell what they're doing so here uh, Pablo's uh, streams are really good I watch them all the time always learn great stuff from them so um, but if you just go here to presenters uh, where is it presenters you can see there are all these different presenters and some of them do different types of uh, work and some of them do use that kind of um, way that I showed you earlier which is the uh, multiple images in in um, Photoshop and uh, they get some amazing results. All right, we're about an hour in and uh, I kind of want to, it's funny, it's like, you know, slowly but surely this thing starts to materialize uh, over time. So here I'm kind of trying to figure out what to do as far as sections are concerned. So I know I'm going to have a, t a tire in here. So I have to kind of create an area for that tire to pop out. A tire but a whole wheel I guess. So I have to have a wheel well in here. And uh, I probably will cut this part out. But it'd be interesting like if it would be like a plane too. Like if this kind of opens up to over here, like this part just opens up to over here and the, and the wheel comes down. There are different thoughts of how to do this. So with Sid Mead's design, I'll bring that up here. So this is pure ref, uh, it's too big, I need to make it smaller. It's a, a reference gathering tool and it's pretty uh, useful, I use it all the time, but you can see here uh, Sid Mead kind of had this idea that uh, in this version of the the spinner right here that this part, part would rotate uh, down and the wheels would pop out of there. So there's a lot of discrepancies between the actual uh, thing that was made and the model. Um, 
these guys, the new one, it's just basically the wheel is inside this area. Like they didn't really do anything to turn it around uh, or anything like that. So they basically are just, um, just uh, let me kind of refocus my camera here. They're, they just um, basically um, have it be a rigid piece. So they didn't really do anything creative where this turns around. Notice it's just one rigid piece, right? And uh, notice here they have glass on their door too. They have glass on top, glass over here, glass over here. Let's see, do they have it in the front? They don't, maybe they have it in the bottom, I don't know. But this was designed based on a uh, design that George Hull did, which is this one right here, which is really beautiful. Um, the concept design for this is really, really brilliant. It's it's very nice. And you can see here, he's done it in uh, on paper. So he basically drew this out. He didn't do it in 3D. Uh, and then I think he comped this in Photoshop. So here he's got a kind of a nice version of it kind of flying. Uh, it's just really beautiful. And uh, from this concept, of course, they built this car, right? So this is the one that they built. They ended up building, but this was what the concept looked like. And same thing with uh, Sid Mead's. This was his concept right here. Like these two were gouache paintings that he did. And they actually built the model. The one at the Peterson was not the one they used in the movie. But if you Google it, you can find out. So here is what I was talking about where, um, you know, the idea was that this would fold up like this and then the tires would pop out of, of that area. But I don't think um, I don't think they went with, with that in the, in the movie. Well, actually, they might have in the movie. I don't know. But... Um, and here's another one where he, uh, oh, sorry, I moved it off. Here's another one where he actually did a painting of what that would look like, right? So this was somebody else, I think. Some Somebody else made a 3D model of it and made it do this. But um, Sid, Sid, uh, Sidney did his this way. He painted it this way for the kind of the builders to build it. And this he painted this as the inside of the car, just really beautiful stuff. And as much as uh, these are beautiful to look at here in the um, as a digital painting, if you actually see the original paintings, they're even more beautiful than that. Um, okay, so back on track. Uh, if I've never drawn or sculpted, can I still learn ZBrush? Um, I don't know. I think uh, you have to have some sort of a, um, I mean, learning ZBrush isn't really the trick. I mean, ZBrush is just a tool like everything else. There are a lot of fundamentals that you have to know. So I, when I teach in uh, kids in college, um, they don't just learn ZBrush. They learn ZBrush their third year in college. Uh, sometimes in one of the schools and the other one the fourth year in college so there's a lot of other things that they learn before they even touch ZBrush and uh, I think you know learning ZBrush isn't really going to solve the problem I think um, you have to learn all those other things and then ZBrush will kind of be the tool to learn after that but that said you know there's nothing to say you can't play around with ZBrush it is subscription-based now, so you can just rent it for a month and try it out. You know, there there's kind of two different types of people. There are people that have never drawn before, that uh, and they use ZBrush and they're great at it. And then, uh, but they do know the fund art fundamentals, right? So that you still need to know that. And then there are people that um, haven't touched clay ever. Uh, and I'm one of them. I, I, I have not sculpted in clay. I would like to. I've never really gotten around to it, but I can sculpt in ZBrush. So um, I would say that you do need to know your art fundamentals uh, before you touch ZBrush um, to be good at it. But um, but you don't have to be a great person, you know, 
great at drawing to be able to be good at ZBrush. All right, so I'm kind of, this is turning to be really, you know, it's kind of interesting because this is really faceted, but this is really smooth. So I'm kind of thinking of getting these two somehow be smooth, but also faceted. So that's kind of the problem I'm solving now. The thing is, you know, if you go to ZBrush Central, you can very quickly tell the artists that are starting out and the artists that are, um, that are good. And um, the good news is that you can see, like, if some people just post their entire workflow, like I wasn't, I wasn't good when I first started. I, I had some pretty bad models uh, initially, and then over time. If you keep working at it, you get better and better and better. That's the only way to get better, is if you work at it. Um, but my students, uh, their semester project usually is pretty compelling, and they, they tend to do good stuff. So coming to it with the knowledge of um, Fundamentals, I think, greatly helps them. So I'm kind of struggling with this upward. Uh, the curve tool, so if you uh, hold Control and Shift with the curve tool, you basically draw it, right? And if you hit Spacebar, you can move it around. And if you tap Alt, then you can bend it and get a you know, get a curvature. And if you tap Alt twice, you get a sharp angle like this. And then you can move the whole thing. All right, let's go back to this. I want to get a line that opposes the, this, this upward line here is really a very strong, powerful, design line that's kind of overpowering what I want to do. So I'm trying to figure out if there's a way I can do another line that intersects it that adds. You know, that continues this curve because this is just out of nowhere, it's just a line, line moving outwards. So that was one idea. Let me see if I can do another one. Nope. At this point, I've, I've tried a hundred different angles, none of them are really working. I think that little thing I just added <laughs> made, made it look a little bit better. <laughs> All right, that's good. But maybe Yeah, I'm really, you know, this, this line here is really bugging me, so uh, I need to get rid of it. How many polys in this model? It's it's still pretty light. It's not that bad. It's about uh, 193,000 polys. So if I bring up the wireframe on it, it's really not that dense. Oh, no. I've been, I've been in perspective mode, and I've been cutting at it. <laughs> So here's a, a, a cool trick to learn. So if you do what I just did, which is basically have perspective on, and you want both sides of the models to match, so right now they don't match, you can use mirror and weld. So I'm going to do that right now. Oh, yeah, I have different subdivision levels on this thing. How many? 
for so this is basically the initial uh, shape we started with and then I went all the way up to here so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of this so I'm going to duplicate it and I'm going to duplicate it again and what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually did I really mess it up or is it fine let's see I guess this would be a good way to find out and here on this one I'm just going to delete the higher subdivision levels and on the other one I'm going to delete the lower subdivision levels let's go to it so there's one two this one I'm going to go all the way up and delete lower all right and let's just smear and weld and then on this one so this is what it looked like and this is what it looks like with all the polygons so let me just bear and weld it uh, like so so these are the kinds of things that happen to you when you're uh, when you're working and you're like oh man so it doesn't seem like there's a big difference but let me make sure mirror and weld so in the high res I can't see it let's see if it I can see it in the low res and if I can't see it in the low res that means we're good so again mirror and weld yep there is a little bit of a difference I can see it all right no problem we can just remember that that's the case and what we can do is we can well let me see again how different it is uh, I wish there was a way to do the mirror and weld with multiple subdivision levels I wonder if uh, the Subtool Master one does that. Let's see, Subtool Master, and there is a mirror option. To one subtool, x axis. Before I do that, it's always a good idea to create a copy and to do a save so we're not messing up our original one. I don't think this is going to work, but I'll give it a try. Why not? Okay, x axis. Okay. Hey, look at that. It does work. Ha! How about that? All right. So, this is uh, it's a good idea to rename this uh, Broken Symmetry. All right, so the thing that I did is I basically used Subtool Master, which again comes free with ZBrush, and there is a mirror option here that will mirror something with multiple subdivision levels. So this one's the Broken Symmetry one, and this is the one we're working on. So the question that started this all is how many polys is this? And this is 128,000 polys, and uh, on the highest subdivision level, but it also has... Um, Oh, wait a minute. It did do the mirroring, but it got rid of the subdivision levels. Uh, man, okay, it's fine. And I can't reconstruct them. I can't. I guess what I could do is I could zero mesh it if I really want to get a lower resolution. But wait a minute, it does look like it does have it. Um, it looks to me like it does have the lower subdivision levels, but why can't I? Um, get to them. Oh, that's why I see them. It's because <laughs> I've got both of them on, and the one below it is the one showing the subdivision. No, it's not. What is going on? Well, this is an interesting thing. Does it have all of them kind of combined? Let's see if it does. So split to similar parts. Or let's do a split to parts. 
Here, this is a kind of a neat trick too, is, is if you're going to uh, split something into separate parts, put it in a folder first. So we'll call it body. <clears throat> and so now it's in here, and when I split it to parts, that uh, it's going to be in it's going to be all in here. Yeah, I think what it did is it it's, it created a low version and a high resolution version, which is good. So what we can do now is we can go to the low resolution version and divide it a few times. We get to four, and that kind of creates a smooth version of it, but that's okay because what we can do is project, and so let me make sure nothing else is visible here except these two guys. So what I want to do is I want to project this detail onto this one right here that's going to have four subdivision levels. So it's easy as doing one button. So I want to make sure I'm on that one. Project all. And there it is. So now I have exactly what I want, which is my model with full symmetry and full four subdivision levels. There it is. All right. So now I can create a, another folder here. Call it broken stuff. And I can just keep broken stuff in there. I'll just move it all the way to the bottom. So if I if there's stuff I don't need, I'll move it there. And so this part I don't need anymore. I'll just move it to the broken stuff folder for now. And then we have our model, but we don't need it to be in a folder, so I'm just going to delete the folder. And we're back to where we started. Oh yeah, uh, the new zero mesher is, is pretty, it is, it's great, it's awesome. It is really effective. It's still not perfect, but it's pretty close. Right, so here we have the two different tops. I think we used the other one. So this one can go into, maybe I'll create a parts folder too. Parts. Uh. Rename folder. Parts. All right. We'll put this in the bottom too. All right. Back on track. I'm really kind of having a hard time uh, getting this front part to do what I want it to do, but I'm getting pretty close. All right, well, this is interesting. I'm not able to sculpt on this thing. What's going on? Uh, okay, it's subdivision level four. All's good. That's good. I think this initial car too, I'm going to move it all the way to uh, broken stuff. Don't need it. All right. Main question. Um, yeah, so that's a good question, right? So your question is like you put your teeth into the into venom, but then you wanted to separate them out, and you can. So here, uh, let's say I move this up, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to merge these two together. All right, so now I have one sub tool. Okay, what? hide these two things. I have one subtool, right? I just have, oh, I guess I have been sculpting on it. Uh, all right, no worries. Okay, so I have one subtool, but this is combined, right? And I want to just sculpt on this, right? 
Um, so what you can do is you can just select the tooth. So just select it like this, a little piece of it. And if you hit Control Shift A, it will just isolate that part. And you can work on that part. And then once you're done, you can show your entire model. Right? Does that make sense? And you can also split it too. So you can go here and just say, okay, well now I want to split them into separate parts. Go to split and then split to parts. And now they're two separate parts. You can do that too. Either way will work. So now I've kind of done something I didn't want to do here, which is um, make this big gouge in here. Uh, so I have to get that out back to it being planar. But the good news is this has kind of forced a new shape on me and I have to go with it. Oh man. So you see, you know, you can always make uh, mistakes. Sometimes they're happy accidents, sometimes they're pain in the butt. Uh, but it's okay. That's why you want to save and save often. All right, so I'm just going to pull this bag thing back out. And then I'm going to mask the rest of the car. And use the clip curve to get my angle back. Okay. Maybe a little bit more. So this is kind of looking a little bit more interesting where I still have that downward swoop like this, but then this is kind of its own thing. So see, sometimes you can make the best use of a mistake and get something new and more interesting. Yep, good, Netrix. I'm glad uh, that worked for you. Did you separate them out or did you do the control A option? Oh man. I'm kind of liking this shape. I'm going to see if I can do something with it. Oh, there are too many, too. yeah, good. Yeah, I wouldn't combine the teeth unless uh, I would keep the teeth separate. Just put them all in one subtool or something, or maybe in groups like the top in the one subtool and the bottom teeth in another. All right. This totally messed up my silhouette that I had that I really liked, but uh, like I said, sometimes things don't go right. I could always go to a saved version, but I think I'm just going to forge ahead with what I got. All right, we have about half an hour to go, and I'm feeling a little bit behind, so i got to really hustle up here. <clears throat> so what's nice is I can always drop in subdivision levels here. level one 
and I can make some changes to this to kind of get back that silhouette. And then go back up. Here we go. It's working now. Yeah, I'm really digging what uh, what I have so far with this new like this looks really kind of neat like that so getting these planes like you know when you're doing the secondary uh, forms getting these planes is kind of a bit of a challenge but once you get them you, they're golden Oh, okay, wow, there's a long question. Um, striking, you're, you're mentioning that sometimes you bring in models from Max. Yeah, you know, sometimes I do that too. Sometimes I bring in a model from an outside program. Uh, lately, I've just been, you know, starting in ZBrush uh, because you're right, it is pretty um, free freeing and you can do a lot of different iterations and options, whereas in other programs, I think, you know, other programs are good for production, but um, I can't imagine designing in Max. Like, there's just so many different things to do. Where it ends in ZBrush, you're just kind of going. But I'm sure there are people that do it. Um, if you're really, really good and comfortable in Max, there's no reason why you can't design in, in Max. But usually it's the other way around. Usually you just do your concepting in ZBrush, and then you maybe take it into Max or some other program to retopo. If you need to, if you don't, so, I mean, like a lot of my workflow doesn't need that anymore. I might do it here for this car because I might want to have the kind of the cut lines and everything established, but I haven't decided yet. I'll know pretty soon here. Probably next week I'll know. All right, let's kind of keep working at this front part to get it to do what we want it to do. Um, um, is it possible? Yeah, you can combine uh, as many, you know, as many or as few subtools as you want. So the way to combine them is you just kind of have to move them around. And by the way, that's easier in 2019 too. So if I wanted to combine, let's say this with this top part, I just move it to where I want it to be. So the this is, you know, these two are the th ones I want to combine. So I can either put one on top of the other, it doesn't matter. And I can choose the one on top and then go to merge and say merge down. Or another thing I could also do is even if they're not next to each other, even if this one's down here, what I can do is I can turn everything off and I can just have those two parts on, right? And then I can go to merge here and say merge visible. Where is it? Merge visible, right? So that will create a new subtool that has both of them. So I'll do that. Merge visible. And now I've got one subtool over here that just has those two, right? That's the only thing it has in the list, right? So you can just merge those two subtools that way. So yeah. Let me delete that so it doesn't clutter up my memory and move back to where we were. Oh, this is something else. Actually, I'll show you guys this uh, since we're here. This is a, another spinner that I was working on a little while back. It's this one right here, um, which I kind of abandoned because I wasn't happy with it. 
So uh, this was a while back, and then um, here's different versions of it. And I also have another one that's kind of cool looking here. Let's see if I can find it. Um, I might not have it. Oh, this one, yeah. So I started uh, this one with this car, an Audi, uh, and uh, this, I think this is just the Audi. But where is it? Maybe I don't have it. Any oh, here it is. Yeah, I did this one as kind of a uh, more of kind of a kind of a military spinner. So it flies, but it also has guns, right? So completely different concept, completely different workflow. Uh, and I just had these in in my in this file that I was working on, so I might as well show them to you. So here are these two subtools that we merged, but they're separate now. And where is our car? Here it is. All right, let's get back to work. <clears throat> I find that a lot of people get intimidated by ZBrush when they first start out uh, because the user interface is pretty unique. But if you haven't used anything else and you start with ZBrush, people who do that tend to have an easier time like if you used Maya or used uh, Blender or some other tool, whatever, and you get into ZBrush, it might be harder for you to understand it. But if you've never used anything before and you just start using ZBrush, it's easier. And then you start complaining that other programs aren't like ZBrush. Because for me, like with customization, ZBrush is, has the best user interface of any any CG program I use. All right. Um, when I uh, when I sculpt characters, I uh, usually start with the actual uh, base mesh. So there's some that come with ZBrush. So when I'm doing a character, like if I'm doing a head. I'll start out with like one of these guys, like this one, if it's a female head, or this one. Um, or here, if you go to a Tool, there's a full-on guy here, this one right here, Nick Zuccarello's uh, ma Human Male. This one is a good one to start with for a character, and then you can just Dynamesh it and then work on it. Um, so yeah. There's a bunch of them. There's a female or whatever. But this one's a really good one uh, right here, the Nick Zuccarello one. I, st I use this a lot, and my students use this a lot, too, to start out. Um, yeah. Are you talking about Demo Soldier? Yeah. Demo Soldier is a demo demo thing. I, you know, I don't think I've ever started anything from there, <laughs> from that one. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, all right. Let's do a quick save. By the way, I usually save a lot more than I do here, but I know that ZBrush saves by itself, and every once in a while I just tap Quick Save just to make sure I have a version of my file. Oh, yeah, uh, that's a very good point. So um, I don't recommend using ZBrush with a mouse at all, at all. It's really hard to use ZBrush with a mouse uh, because... Um, I, you know, you know. That said, I've seen people use ZBrush effectively with a mouse, but it's a lot harder, right? It's a lot harder to use ZBrush with a mouse. Definitely get a tablet. Uh, and um, I know two kinds of people. Some people like to use, uh, and I'm one of them. They like to use a tablet, which it does not have a screen on it. It's just a separate tablet, and those are relatively inexpensive. Wacom makes the best ones. Uh, and uh, I've been using Wacom tablets forever, love them, and um, you can't go, go wrong with one of those. And the medium size is the one I use, which is fine. Uh, you don't need the bigger size. I mean, I don't know why anybody would use the bigger size. I think some people like to make big gestures, maybe. So um, the medium one, or even the small one, is good uh, if you want to use a tablet. And then the other types of people like a Cintiq, so they like to actually be working on the display. And there's some people that only can do that, and that's fine too. That will run you a lot more. But I think they just came up with kind of inexpensive versions of it. So if you're one of those people that has a, a difficult time 
working on something that you're not looking at directly, um, then you might want to consider getting a Cintiq. But other than that, a, a tablet is just fine. Uh, and if you want to work with a mouse, that's okay too. But uh, I feel that um, it slows you down quite a bit. A mouse does for ZBrush. Okay, so there's some people saying that Cintiq make a big difference for them. Yeah, I, I totally get it. Um, all right, so another person says they're using the medium uh, Wacom. That works great for them. Um, and... Oh, I see what you're saying. The military, yeah, not the demo soldier, but the uh, the military spinner. Yeah, I mean, that's just a sketch. That's like, you know, 20, 20 minutes or so. Um, I was working on a uh, on a CAD. Uh, so these parts here, I'll bring that thing back. Where is it? Uh, this one right here, the guns are CAD parts that I brought in from a CAD program. So I was just trying out the, this as a as a thing, and then I said, oh, let's just load it into ZBrush. And it probably looks like a turtle shell because, because it's green, this top part. But I bet if I change the color, it won't look as turtley. Like if I just choose uh, red. Right, so now it looks less like a turtle. <laughs> but I, I totally see what you're saying though. Um, all right. Okay, enough messing around. I need to finish this thing. All right. So yeah, I mean, it, you know, you might, you might want to do is don't just buy a Cintiq because it kind of tends to be expensive. Is maybe uh, try them both out. Like if there's a store someplace near you where you can try them out, try them out, see where you feel more comfortable. For example, for me, um, I find that I'm faster on a uh, on a tablet, but sometimes I go to clients and they don't have tablets; they just have Cintiqs, and I work on them, and it's nice. I tend to be able to work on both, but I prefer you using the tablet for most times because I know that nine times out of ten um, I will be using a tablet, so I better be good on it. Because when I show up at a customer, they don't have a tablet, they don't have a Cintiq. I usually just bring my tablet with me and can use it. But I'm not going to bring a Cintiq with me. <laughs> I do have a, actually, that said, I do have a, a Cintiq portable that I do take to clients too. And uh, that's a beautiful machine too. It's a, it's a whole computer and a Cintiq in one. And um, all right. Cool. Yeah, some people have both. All right. As you can see here, little by little, this part's coming together. It's looking more and more real. I want to be able to do that with this. And I keep struggling to do it. So I just need to not do anything else and just do that for the rest of the duration here. For the next 15 minutes, I want to nail this down. All right. Yeah, Bluetooth is nice. I think Bluetooth is nice because you can sit on your couch and put this on a TV or something and, and kind of sculpt on your TV. All right. So I'm using a custom user interface if you guys haven't guessed so far or if you're new to my streams and um, I keep changing it and modifying it all the time and I recommend that when you start using ZBrush after you get comfortable with it start making your own user interface there's plenty of tutorials on how to do it 
Uh, Pablo has one on his website, Pablo Munoz Gomez, and uh, his website is ZBrush something, uh, what is it called? Um, here, I'll show it to you guys. Last distraction, I promise. ZBrush Guides, that's what it's called. He's got a lot of great tutorials on there. Oh, that's not what we wanted. Go back. So it's zbrushguides, one word, dot com. And uh, there's a lot of resources. There's a lot of good stuff here. And his streams are really good, too. So, uh, And I think he's got one here, I think, under resources um, or tutorials. I think he's got one that's how to customize the ZBrush user interface. So, so zbrushguides.com for that. All right, stop wasting time, Ara, and get this thing done. Um, it I did change the colors too, yeah. That's easy enough to do also. It's basically just go to preferences and um, one of these is the color one, eye colors, and then you can just change them in here. It's pretty straightforward. When I teach my students, you know, I show them how to change the colors and all of them do it. All right. So this is kind of a panel that comes up this way. Houses something, I don't know what it is, but it does. And so let's see, I'm just kind of working myself from the parts that are done to the parts that are not. I should be working over here. The problem with, is though, if you customize your colors, sometimes you can't read certain things. So always kind of do it little by little. Mm, nope. Stay away from horizontal and vertical lines. All right, okay, so here we go. So here I'm kind of, again, trying to figure out how this thing opens up maybe or has like some parts that uh, If I don't finish this part in uh, in the next 10 minutes, I will do it um, before we do the next stream because I want it to be done with that today. Uh, it's coming together little by little, but uh, it's going to need more work. I can go a little over today. It's fine. I try to keep these to two hours. And by the way, if you miss part of any part of this and you want to go back to it, uh, it will be recorded so you can watch this over again. If there's a part you didn't, uh, you want to see. All right. Yeah, you definitely want to not uh, be uh, digging around in the UI. You want everything that you use most of the time to be as accessible as possible. Ho you know, you can use hotkeys too. Some people prefer those. So I'm getting like a little bit of this kind of chatter you see over here because this is not, there's not enough geometry in this front part. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to divide my model one more time. So right now I am at 126,000 polygons, which is a lot, but not that much. I'm going to go one more subdivision level. 
So now I'm at subdivision level 5, and I am at 506 polygons. I mean, 506,000 polygons. It's a lot, but I don't think it's that bad. I don't think it's that bad. Definitely want to keep it under a million. And then once I'm kind of done with some of these shapes, what I'm going to do is start cutting it up into different pieces. Because if I just work on one model, it's going to be huge. It's really going to be interesting to put um, lights in the front. I don't want it to be like this. I don't want these to be lights somehow. I want the lights to pop up from somewhere, maybe from here. So. Um, I teach a, I teach a bunch of different classes and depends on the semester but the ZBrush class that I teach is at Otis College of Art and Design and it is a, a, a course for gaming to create gaming assets so they learn how to create assets in ZBrush so they basically some of them already know ZBrush a lot of them don't and uh, then they basically create an asset, a character for a game. And uh, I usually teach that in the spring. But I also teach other classes. Teach an introduction to 3D, character design, uh, visual communications, animation, advanced animation, although animation is not really my thing. I try not to teach those courses, but if they don't have a teacher and they need me, I do it. I'm really struggling with this kind of faceted look here and I have to figure out a way. I kind of figured out how to do it on the outside. I have to figure out something to do over here. Usually if I get stuck on something like this, I usually take a break and come back to it, but I'm going to soldier through this time. All right, so we got about six minutes left. If you guys have last minute questions, now is a good time to ask. I've had some amazing students do amazing work. A lot of them are working in the industry, loving life. A couple are at Treyarch. Some are at Disney. Right, I think we're getting somewhere, finally. By the way, if you guys are having a hard time, if anybody's having a hard time, uh, just know that all artists have hard times. 
even if you're like the best artist ever, you're going to have a bad day. Um, we use Substance, yep, we use Marmoset, we use Unreal Engine. Some students use Unity, it depends. I don't I don't usually spend too much time in the game engine. We spend most of the time in uh in ZBrush and uh we just this last semester we started using Substance Painter. They just got it. The school just got it. And uh students want a whole class on that, which we can probably do soon. I'll see if I can use Substance in this, uh, for this, you know, if we have time, we'll use Substance for this too. Get some great looking detail and dirt and stuff like that. Um, what's the best way to merge things together to not have uh, uh, problems with border polys? Um, so, I think that the way you would do that is uh, to, you know, merge them together and maybe Dynamesh the model and that will kind of create one shape. And I don't know if that works for everything, but I've done that sometimes. Um, so I would, uh, that's how I would merge them together to get rid of borders. You can Boolean them together too, but then, um, yeah, I think you probably get better results with Dynamesh, but then you lose levels and all that stuff. All right, somebody's asking me about Houdini. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, Houdini is huge. Um, yeah, uh, studios are using it. The studio I'm working at right now uses it, and uh, yeah, Houdini's a. It's a. I mean, it's not ZBrush. It's definitely not to do things like this. It's more of an effects tool. But yeah. It always cracks me up what studios use, like what they adopt over time. All right, we still have a little bit of that faceting in the front. I'm kind of really liking this view of it. It's pretty nice. I'm happy with that. But um, the inside part is still giving me <clears throat> a little bit of a challenge. I could get rid of this facet, Let's see what that does. Oh, that's a little bit better. This has become something completely different than what it started out as, but that's okay. So I think one more facet to get rid of. Let's see if I just completely obliterate this facet. Like if we just have a smooth top, if that's going to work out better. Uh, let's see. So we are at nine o'clock, my time which is usually when I end. I might go for just a tiny bit longer. Uh, so ask your last questions. And if, um, if not, I will be continuing this in a couple of weeks on Friday. So I'm usually on Friday nights, my time. You can always see the schedule online. So if you go to ZBrush Live, you can always see the schedule of when I'm going to be on. So I'm on every other Friday uh, this time. Oh yeah. Here we go, finally, last minute it worked. Um, so yeah, so uh, if you guys enjoyed this, tune in next Friday and uh, you can see me continue it further. And if you can't, uh, then you can also catch the video of it 
I think a little bit after uh, it airs. So with that, I will uh, say good night to good morning, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for watching, and we will see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.